thanks for being here to talk about uh, our book project. And the book is not finished. It's it's 90 percent finished, but uh, a, a little more than ninety. But uh, since we have you here, your questions, your interrogations uh, help us uh, see where some of the question may be, and we have still time to adapt the book depending on 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 the question. So thanks very much. Um, so our book is on, it's called the Economic Democracy, a User's Guide. Uh, and what do we mean by economic democracy? Very simply, it's to give citizens uh, power over the different levers of the economy. Our perspective is, is, is clearly democratic socialist. Uh, at the same time, I think it's really our, an effort to adapt it to the realities of the 21st century. How do we give real meaningful control uh, to people over the levers of the economy, but how do we do that in the, in, in the 21st century? So without doing a presentation of the book uh, uh, in itself, I'll, I'll just give you an idea of some of the questions we're trying to answer. And I emphasis on trying. We don't have all the answers, obviously. It's not a book just on the Canadian context. It's, it's well, I would say the whole world, basically the Western world, but so this is not a critique of the NDP. It's, it's just a, some... Uh, it's, it's, it, and it is a critique a little bit of the whole social democratic movement where it is at this, at this moment in its history. So one of those questions is, uh, actually, what is the vision of social democratic parties today? Are, are we just here to regulate and mitigate the negative aspects of capitalism, or are we here to, to develop alternatives to capitalism? One of the reasons that we, um, we began discussing this and talking about this is, and I'm going to be a little more harsh, um, is the fact that the, the social democratic parties today aren't offering a vision of a different society. Uh, they're not offering an alternative. They're not talking about an alternative. What they are talking about is a system to mitigate the damages that our current socioeconomic system is creating. And a long time ago, these parties had actually very clear and specific ideas, and actually too clear, and too specific. They had blueprints of the type of society they wanted. And those blueprints didn't sort of work out the same way. So they threw the, the, you know, the, the baby out with, with the bathwater. How does the union movement stop just being on the defensive and, and, and uh, with all the great works that, that that's been doing is, is, uh, is uh, under attack? And how do we open perhaps a new front, which is not just wages and, 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 and uh, pension and all these other issues, but also power? Power, participation in uh, real power, and participation in the workplace. The question is also uh, the co-op movement, because at the very beginning, and Tom will talk a little bit all, about history. In the beginning, the cooperative movement was a political movement. It wasn't just, well, let's do a little co-op here, and you know, it, it was a political movement, and that has been lost. And we also know that the state is not necessarily <laughs> progressive. We know that the state can. Uh, can be used by, by the right, and, and they do. Uh, so they have sometimes the right wing, the right wing rhetoric is against the state, but they're not against the state. They're for the state serving them, which is extremely different. We know that uh, we, we, we could have a democratic social society and still have a lots, of, lots of market mechanisms. And how does the left think about the market? And we think the market is not the enemy. Capitalism is the, the enemy, not the market. So we have to know which capitalism we want to build an alternative to. So, so uh, uh, because sometimes, to be frank, parts of the left are caught in, in a rhetoric that they're challenging a capitalism that existed 100, 150 years ago. And we're in a different logic and our alternatives much match what we're trying to be the alternative to. Economic democracy isn't one model. Economic democracy isn't one size fits all. Economic democracy is about finding institutions which empower people to have control over their economic, uh, over their economic destinies, and those institutions are things like cooperatives, community funds, uh, labor funds, uh, the right of workers to elect people on, on on the management boards, and various associations. Yes, as well, public enterprises in, in 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 certain sectors, but democratic public enterprise in which there's actual participation of of, of people in how these things are run. And this whole different uh, panoply, I can't think of a good word for panoply, uh, 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 of, of, of alternatives uh, are, 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 the, are basically the essence of economic democracy. And our proposal is that this become 
the heart of social democratic parties once again and to promote these types of institutions so that one day the majority of economic activity is through institutions that are controlled by their participants. We know that what we're suggesting is, uh, would, would the, I think it, uh, who's the author that said, um, um, yeah, yeah, the problem with socialism, it would, it would take too many of our evenings. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the question of participation is, is, is we understand a, a problem, but that means that as a society, we would need to create those spaces for participation and, and debate, spaces that don't necessarily exist. One of the things you learn in, in business school early on is externalities. That when there is an exchange between a buyer and a seller, everything else is externalized. What the, if I buy something from you, we don't have to discuss about what its impact is on anyone else. So the idea of democratizing the economy is you're now finding ways to internalize those externalities. So when there's different people around the table, uh, consumers and producers, and you create institutions in which there's more participation, well, those externalities become internalized, and the allocation of resources are thought in a different ma manner. And I'm going to give something concrete. I don't know if you know a town called Montragon in northern Spain, in the Basque Country. This is a cooperative town, a completely cooperative society. And their idea isn't just to make more stuff to sell so that we can have bigger profits. Their idea is, you know what, we'd like to have a park or we'd like to have a school that teaches the Basque uh, language to our children. So they're making different types of decisions because the decision makers live in their communities. The, 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 the investors live in their communities, their neighbors. And so this is the idea of actually creating real institutions that actually give people direct, uh, uh, direct power over the things that directly uh, affect them. Because we're fans of the co-op model and so forth, but we can't tomorrow morning tell all the corporations, oh, by the way, you're all co-ops now. You know, there needs to be some sort of a transition. Uh, yes, there is more work participation on the boards, and but also in other types of committees, whether it's on, on pensions, whether it's on uh, 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 work planning, whether it's on uh, other subcommittees on work family balance and all, all, all kinds of stuff that could be linked within the workplace. So we actually think that there's a way of, in some cases, create something new on the side of existing companies, and in other cases, uh, penetrate and try to influence within and try to grow the power, whether it's through employee stock ownership plans or investment from labor funds. The largest stock owner in the United States are the pension funds. The people's pension funds basically own the United States economy, yet how come people don't actually have any influence over them? So the, the, the structures are there, it's the fact that there's no, there's no democratic participation or, 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 or structures for people to have an influence. Why are we pushing so hard on this idea of economic democracy? It's really because we think it's not just in an intellectual uh, effort. It's really because we believe that this could be the cement to create a movement that would rally social democratic parties and also some, some and parties to the, to, to the left of traditional social democratic parties. The labor movement, the co-op movement, the new movements as social economy, ethical investment and so forth and also parts of the environmental movement. That's why we say it's a user's guide, it's not just an intellectual book, it's actually almost, almost a recipe uh, to say, you know, this is what we need to put in place. At the same time, we're not dogmatic, we, we're not saying there's one solution. Sometimes on the left we do that, you know, there's a problem and we say, okay, I have the full, complete, total solution, and this is it. No, we, we, do, we can't think that way. What we think is, we won't have one alternative, we'll have a sum of alternatives that together will help us build a different economy.